Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and today we have our second part of our interview with David Quinn. I'm so excited. You guys are going to love this episode. Uh, this is all about Carnage, It's a Wonderful Life, and I asked David kind of what his perspective on Carnage is and like what he feels the character is and what's important to the character, and of course, that answer you know shifts with every creator who's ever worked on the character, but we haven't really had anyone on our show that's worked on Carnage specifically and, uh, and told such an impactful story about the character, and so this was just a really rare opportunity and I'm glad that David made the time and that we were able to get him on the show so make sure you go and check out his other work I'll put a link to all of his stuff down in the description box below so without further ado let's dive into this great interview the second half of it where we talk about carnage it's a wonderful life yeah absolutely um, um, like you know with the story that you were telling which you know kind of had a few threads from um, like you said uh, carnage mind bomb which was the other one shot that was kind of part of this um, series of, of books that, that uh, you know Brevoort was bringing about and uh, and but I saw even though it had a couple tying threads to it I liked a lot of the stuff you brought to these characters like Cletus Cassidy Ashley Kafka and, and John Jameson in particular um, what elements were some of your favorite that you brought to these three in this story uh, well you know thinking back to characters like central villain characters like Dracula, as I mentioned, and Macbeth, Hannibal Lecter. Mm -hmm. You have to have really strong characters around them to tell a good story. And I guess I learned that from Tomb of Dracula, if nowhere else. And so I, I wanted to come up with a story that forced these other interesting, strong characters to live in the Carnage world and test them all, including Carnage. And um, Carnage becomes sort of the mirror or the abyss that... Uh, Kafka and Jameson uh, stare into right. and they experience their transformation and their fear and their pain and their weakness um, but they don't lose themselves um, even though it's basically like 32 pages of mind effing them you know? <laughs> right. um, I, I think I also um Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, okay. but you know, um, John Jameson has the man wolf within him. Right. Uh, Kafka is the healer, right? Right. But Kafka lives in a very sick world. She, you know, she people become attracted to the world of phobias because they have a certain counterphobia themselves, and I think. Maybe I'm borrowing too much from my own obsessions in the Faust Love of the Dam story, but uh, Kafka reminds me a lot of the Doctor de Camp character in, in Faust, mm -hmm. who gets into a twisted relationship with the monster uh, John Jasper's Faust um, because she thinks she can save him. Right. So it's like loving what you fear, fearing what you love. It's all those things, and we do that sometimes. So, I mean, that that drove so much in the story, including where she really stands up to him in a great way. She, uh, I should say, she stands up to Carnage slash Cletus in a great way by forcing him to think about his whole life and how a part of him is not the god of mad chaos, but actually someone who's pretty desperate about trying to control things so they won't change and get bad for him, like he remembers with his parents, and with Billy, his friend. Billy, Billy's billy got to be his friend because Billy calls him Cleet. Right. You don't make up a name like that for someone <laughs> unless you, you're really their pal. <laughs> right. so, I mean, this, come, this, this is what I meant when I said that. Was I wanted to get to the humanity too. Because um, believe me, in a mature rated book, even at that time, we were certainly allowed to do some pretty nightmare visions. Um, the scenes of Spider-Man, multiple Spider-Men hanging from nooses. Right. There's also body horror scenes where people are transforming against their will. And there's terrible, like, cold corporate horror where they're closing down and outsourcing care of the violent criminals. And some of them are going to end up dead as a result. Uh, and no one cares. Yeah, I I am reminded a lot of um, I think it was in the the, the maybe seventies and into the eighties where a lot of mental health facilities fundings were cut 
um, and a lot of uh, the patients were just the really like the really intense patients that ne- you know needed more care got shifted out elsewhere. But a lot of patients were just released. And I remember thinking about that the whole time while reading this book. <laughs> I was like, that is a very real thing and scary thing uh, to to have your to work in a facility like that, like Ashley Kafka does, to be so strong and face, like you said, her fears every day. I mean, she's almost like Harley Quinn without giving in to the Joker. She stood her ground and faced her demons and put them in their place um, and made them realize they are, in some way, they are demons, but also tries to find their humanity. And I love the character. I mean, I think she's her and John Jameson are fantastic, uh, especially together. But um, as as different people to try to help, uh, you know, others who are are struggling with either you know um, um, mental health issues or or you know something or you know they're or they're just too some might be too far gone like Cletus. But I like that um, that you did approach those things in this storyline. So knowing you know having done that and doing these things where you know it was mature rated, did that. Did that give you any free, like more freedom in the book, or did that actually make the book more of a challenge to write for you? Um, I think it, it freed up a lot. Yeah. Um, and I've watched, um, I've watched Marvel comics since. I mean, I don't think I read any Marvel comics in the first decade of the <laughs> new century. Mm-hmm. But I've been reading um, Immortal Hulk lately. Yeah. And, I mean, that's like comes from that same sort of. Uh, really interesting cerebral but also body wrenching body horror like a David Cronenberg film or a Brian Yusna film Mm -hmm. or a Stu Gordon film Um, I'm I'm mentioning you know films I grew up with just because that's like easy shorthand for me I'm sure there's lots of other things you can compare this book to (laughs) but that's like a very literate horror version of the Hulk so I mean obviously you know there's an audience for that and we reached some of them in 1995-96 um and there's even more now i guess with even 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 when the comics are just a shadow of their former selves i think you know, the hulk book probably sold six or seven times in the 90s what it sells now and it's not because it was necessarily always better it's just because comics distribution was that much bigger than like, right um yeah, and that's uh, that's great to hear. I, I assumed it would be more freeing, but I, I imagined that there, you know, at times it would be like, well, how far do I go? But you seem to have a that would be something for me. But you have seem to have a very good grasp, and I think it's because you write a lot of these characters and you have an interest in these styles of characters. And and referencing uh, Tomb of Dracula, by the way, oh man, you're speaking to my heart because uh, I love that whole Marvel Wolfman Gene Colan thing. So. Uh, so that's nice to hear that that had an influence uh, on you when it comes to how you approach these things, but also, like you said, Faust and these things. So, um, shift you know, shifting gears to the art of this book because we did mention Kyle Holtz earlier. His his work on this is is amazing. I mean, it it rem- it was almost like watching the movie The Thing, but setting it in an insane asylum um, with with a with a. Uh, even more aggressive director than John Carpenter, which is say, uh, saying a lot and, and a compliment to my, uh, Kyle Holtz. Um, he also did Mind Bomb too, uh, but but his work I feel really sings here. Uh, so from the dialogue scenes in the real world to decapitating and hanging Spider-Man in the nightmare world, uh, you know this book obviously is very frightening but beautiful in that dark way. So was there moments that Kyle drew? That you know whether he was translating something you wrote or adding something you didn't write that just made your skin crawl when when you read this. Uh, I think that's pretty easy to say. Like like I said, I've worked with Kyle in a few different things. Right. We'd had t- a chance to do uh, for a while. I lived in Ann Arbor and he lived in uh, Columbus, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, Columbus or Toledo, I f- I'm going to forget which one it is. Anyway, <laughs> Ohio, Michigan. Right, we were right. going to the same. Midwestern conventions quite a lot in the 90s. So we spent a lot of time having conversations and meals and breakfasts and drink after work and stuff like that. So we had a lot of common ground. Um, we haven't worked together in a while, but I, I have a feeling like if we did, if I did give him another story or he gave me another idea for something to write for him or some editor assigned us to something together, I mean, we'd step right back into it. So I kind of know what I'm going to get when I work with Kyle. Mm-hmm. And I can tell him, you know, say something, some obscure thing that I know he's going to get. Like, we're both fans of singers like Freddie Mercury and Bjork. Mm-hmm. And we're, 
friends of James O'Barr and fans of his work. So, and of course he knows Faust. So if I mention something from any of those milieu, it's gonna, he's gonna like put a shade of it in there. But also I can just trust him to do the crazy body horror stuff and the squiggly alien symbiote stuff just immaculately, right? And, and you can practically hear that stuff slithering across the page when you look <laughs> yeah. at his art. So I knew that part was going to be great. So the fun, and, and if anything, the surprise was in seeing what he did with normal, normal moments. Um, there's a moment in, it's, sorry, it's a different book, but it's the first thing that comes to mind, mm -hmm. where uh, in a book called Exiles, which is an Ultraverse book that Marvel published that I wrote I two remember. issues of yeah. Ultra One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of them has a it's a story about a sort of wolverine analog type character called i think wolf blade is his name or something like that anyway you know it's the 90s of the lots of guys with claws <laughs> so um he has a daughter in my story and it's a story a little bit like uh it's a wonderful life it's a little bit of a story at home maybe i was thinking about getting married and having a kid someday i don't know <laughs> But, you know, it was definitely a story where, like, his, his little girl sees the monsters that he sees. And so he's got a scene of just this little girl in her room getting a scary thought. You know, and it's, there are scenes in this book with um, Ashley and, and John. Uh, not even Werewolf John, but just John. <laughs> right. Astronaut, tough guy John, um, where they have a moment of fear or pain. And, you know, those are the scenes that really popped for me. Those are the, you know, if you're going to say, like, you know, made my skin crawl, right? You say, <laughs> yeah, see, I've experienced that real fear. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. I, you know, that's something I never thought of is is you because if you have that experience with them and you have that background and friendship with them, you expect the, the insanity stuff. Um, and like you said, the surprises are the normal things. Like, I never... I never thought about that because yeah, when he draws those scenes, he's actually really great at it too, um, and uh, that just speaks obviously. I mean, we could probably spend another hour gushing about Kyle's work and how much of a professional and oh, yeah. amazing person he is. So, um, you know, uh, so it, we but we talked about Kafka earlier, and like I said, I'm a big fan, and, and my interpretation of her in the story, when I especially when I reread it, um, was you know that she's kind of the angel in a way to Carnage's devil. She's like the Nancy to his Freddy Krueger, and even you mentioned uh, Hannibal Lecter earlier. He, she's kind of the Clarice to his Lecter, uh, but John Jameson, he's the kind of the gray area. Like if they're the if Kafka and Carnage are the two opposites. Uh, you know, Jameson is that wild card in the middle, I felt anyway. Um, he kind of braces his monster side of Manwolf pretty early on while Ashley, like you said earlier, stands up and fights against Cletus. So what was that, you know, pinning that down and figuring out these characters, like, you know, figuratively, literally in the story, like what did you learn about each of these characters while writing them that you maybe didn't expect to, to learn? Okay, I know I touched on this briefly when I was talking about how they remind me of Jade DeCamp and John Jasper from Faust. Right. So I knew that I went sort of straight to those kinds of uh, archetypical characters, mm -hmm. I guess you might call it, you know. Um, but there were other surprises along the way. I mean, it's really uncomfortable if you're inhabiting the feelings of these characters. Uh, when they stand up to Carnage, they call him out for his hypocrisy. They say when he really wants to control things, he's not truly as chaotic and random and mad as he pretends to be. And they're kind of like, you know, taking away what he's what he lives for. Um, but Kafka also has to fight with what she feels is like her weakest weapon, and that's her gut feelings, hmm. not her intellect, not her training. Not her expertise, but her gut. So um, I tried to go to that uncomfortable place with her. And I tried to go to the uncomfortable place with John Jameson, um, where the man will truly lose his control. Because, you know, this probably was instilled in me from a very, very early age in reading him in, in a Spider Man comic, where, you know, he's one of those supernatural villains who's just barely in control of his mad beast inside you know <laughs> if it ever got if it ever, if it ever get out got out you know 
Um, yeah. <laughs> it's the end. Yeah, it's over, right? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's 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 where I went with them. Awesome. Um, and going back to the, what I said at the top, I mean, I was conscious of the fact that, you know, it, it was, it was it had to be an ensemble book, and everybody had to have a challenge, and everyone had to have a, something of a change and a, and a learning from it. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, and that's, I think that's the, the makings of any great story is when you, when you do have that as a focus, like, you know, obviously things do change because it's in a collaborative effort. So there's always a chance that, you know, Tom Brevoort as editor or Kyle might have something to interject, but ultimately you went on that path and took those characters on that path. And I got to say, like, even rereading it, cause I read that as a kid, I must've you know been like maybe 15 or something when that book came out. And when rereading it recently, even, I was like, wow, <laughs> like if my mo- if my mom knew I read this, um, but uh, but she at this at that time I was already a Crow fan and she already knew I, I liked uh, Romero and, and Carpenter and all those guys, so she was like that was pretty normal for me. Um, but you earlier you did mention because I wanted to kind of use this as we ra- start wrapping up, which is you did mention about because we talked a lot about Kafka and John Jameson and your approach to them, but you mentioned you also wanted to find that humanity within the alien stuff and explore more alien stuff and humanity of Cletus. And one of the ways you did that was Billy Bentine, um, which who you talked about earlier, he appeared very, you know, in a Spider-Man annual number 28. I think it was like the second or third appearance of Carnage. And it's a book that most Carnage fans don't know exists actually and I always re- mention it I'm always mentioning it to him I'm like you gotta check out this annual it's it's Spider-Man one-on-one with Carnage and you find out about Carnage's childhood you find out he had a, a friend when he was a kid and like you said he called him Cleet so that must mean they were really good friends so I'm curious like you know you had him you had Billy show up in one of the nightmare sequences as a young boy um, which I think is very telling of Cletus and his mind and the fact that there is that connection still. So was that your idea to bring Billy in? Or I know ideas are a hard thing to exactly pinpoint and remember where they come from, but, um, you know, was it, do you remember where B- the idea to include Billy came from? And what do you think makes him so pivotal to that tiny bit of humanity that might still be inside Cletus? Uh, part of the answer is boring and part of it is exciting. Okay. So get, get ready for that. Okay. The boring part of the answer is um, I'm not as crazy as people think I am. There were editors at DC who didn't want to work with me because they saw Faust, and that's okay. That's they're they're entitled to do that. <laughs> but you know, I'm not you know I'm not crazy. When I get a job, I do my homework, do my research, and see what goes into the story, and try to do the best story for that kind of character that I can. I really try to make it work. So I'm a big respect. I have a big respect for. Um, for continuity, hmm. as, the, as the fans do. Right. So, and I've been rewarded for that in moments when somebody like you, as a sharp reader, says, "Yeah, that was good." And not only did you use that character, but you used it correctly. And he's still a kid in Carnage's mind. Right. He'll always be seven years old, or whatever, whatever they were, you know. Hmm. So, um, I don't remember what they were, but that's I found him in the research. I, I read some synopsis of. Basically, all the things that had happened. I read Mind Bomb, uh, which I think was maybe the only Carnage comic I had read through and through. Um, and I, then I found a few of the Spider-Man guest appearances, and I read those. And so um, the boring part is that it is um, just homework. <laughs> when you do it, you want to write these characters. Yeah. You have to do it. Otherwise, it's disrespectful to everybody. And the other part is, it's it's exciting because these are the gems. These are the little things. There was a reason someone put it put the kid in Amazing Spider-Man Annual Twenty Eight, and that's because the kid is key to understanding Carnage. I I couldn't agree more. It's uh, it was one of those things like when I was reading it. Like I said, um, it's probably something that. I didn't connect the dot when I was younger, but because I mean, unfortunately, I can't really remember. But reading it as an adult, I did. I found that insanely clever. I was like, "Wow, I, I can't believe this." And I was hoping that was your answer because uh, I too am a like I worked in comics for a while, and uh, and I am a sucker for uh, and a stickler for continuity. I mean, I know sometimes you can't always make things fit, so you do the best you can. But in some instances, I do believe in putting in the work and doing that research. And so when I saw Billy pop up in this as a kid, to me, just that one page just uh, 
made us so many things clear to me in trying to under because Cletus I would say was never a character I ever tried to put my, my myself in his shoes I just was like oh he's a scary bad guy and he's effective and that's great I think this was that first book where I finally was like this in the annual where I was like oh n- this makes sense now like now he makes sense on some level to me psychologically and um so yeah no I'm that's it's really great to hear I mean it's a and like what you said like to not do that research it it can be it can be in my eyes to be perceived as very disrespectful. I know some people in, work in comics that feel differently, and they just do whatever they want, and and that's you know that's fine, and they go tell good stories maybe. But but for me, it's like I I'm such a stickler for that stuff. If if it matters to the character, it should still matter to the character. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I reread recently Swamp Thing by Alan Moore and. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve Fissett and John Tottleton, and I love those stories. I know there were other collaborators that work with them, but you know the run I'm talking about. And nothing that they did that was transforming Swamp Thing into a different realm and a different kind of story, nothing that they did was disrespectful to the great classic horror of the Len Wein, Bernie Wrightson right. original. Right. So I mean, so you live up to live up to uh, the past, live up to history. And if you're going to add to the legacy, add to it in a way that that that's respectful. I couldn't agree more. And uh, and that actually leads us to our last question, which is kind of a loaded one. I mean, mo- I feel like some of mine are. I, I know I get very wordy with my questions, so I appreciate I appreciate you enduring. Um, but this last one, I guess, is is more too for fans out there uh, because you're the first person I've had on my show that has actually written the character of Carnage, and there's so many Carnage fans, so. Everyone's heard for 500 plus episodes now my opinion on the character, what I interpret him as. But who is Cletus Cassidy to you? I know we've touched on this some in the episode, but just kind of it, to sum it up, uh, who's Cletus to you? Who's Carnage to you? And why do you think he's so appealing to fans? And why should non fans maybe try to take interest in him? Wow, that, that's a big one. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the only way I could possibly answer it is to step back just a little bit and okay. say, Okay, I'm glad you said, who is he to me? Yes. Because I think he could be a lot of things to a lot of people. I haven't read what's going on with him lately just from not reading as many Marvel comics as I used to when I was writing for them. Right. Um, But, you know, I think who he he was to me when I worked on this story and who he remains when I think of him in the absolute, uh, separate from any other stories by any other people, is, um, is... as big a horror as he can be in the world, it's all because of his vulnerability. That's why I say Billy is the key. Um, that's why in my story he says, some, I don't remember the exact words, I'm sorry, I really should look it up. But he says something about how, why does it have to change? He can't stand it when things change. He's out of control when things change. And it's not even a choice with him, it's tragic. He's just hooked to try to control things. So if you thought maybe manipulating his father to killing his mother proves that he was just born evil, well, that's okay, and you could say that, but that's sort of a superficial and superstitious, limited kind of story. Rather, look at it as a tragic thing, like he has to try to take control, and everyone loses as a result. Mom, dad, and little Cletus. Yeah. So um, that's where the that's where Billy comes in again. Um, he he couldn't control what happened with Billy. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it, it makes sense to why because he couldn't, like you said, is why it lingers in his mind, and maybe why he always will see Billy as. A seven-year-old kid. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm interested in that. Um, I am interested in that that tragic uh, interpretation of a character like this, rather than just simply, you know, he's the ultimate evil. Right, <laughs> right, right. Which I mean, can, can you do interesting stuff with that? Sure, but like you said, it's like uh, every writer approaches something different. So some writers like that supernatural easy explanation of things where it's like ah he's just evil but 
I think there then there are the writers uh, who it sounds like you know you, you obviously and definitely me as a, a fan and reader. I like that deep dive. I like that understanding of what what is evil in this instance. And I feel like you and Kyle and Tom Brevoort and everyone who worked on this book uh, handled that very well. Also, all your other work, like you know when you write Lady Death and Faust and Doctor Strange, like. You put in the Ultraverse stuff, which I do. I remember Exiles. I really like that series a lot, actually. Um, there is there is a lot of love, I feel, and passion and work that goes into your stuff. And uh, and that, why to me, is why I wanted so badly to have you on the show and and, uh, and why I can't thank you enough for, for doing it. I mean, it, it means a lot having you here, sir. Ah, thanks so much. It's oh. a pleasure for me. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't thought about this story in a while. I looked at it and I was like, "Wow, we did a lot of crazy stuff in this story." <laughs> this, I, I hope, I, I really hope. I mean, it's a shame now because obviously the uh, the Carnage movie was supposed to come out in October, so I feel like if Marvel was going to reprint these in some form, they would have already contacted you to let you know. But now that the movies got pushed back a year, I'm hoping, you know, that word of mouth can get around about these books and and get a new release of them, and maybe even, I mean, I don't know if you have any interest in this, but I would love. To see Billy uh, Bentine back in continuity for one more story with Carnage, um, and I, I would love to see you write it and Kyle draw it. I mean, that would be this the thrill of a lifetime for me. Okay, call me. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Tom Brevoort? You got get, call your friend here. He would love it. But you know, um, I think they they reprinted a ton of Carnage stuff in a book called Carnage Classic, which they yes. sent me, and yes. I guess I got paid for. So I mean, it's out there, and some of the Doctor Strange has been reprinted, but I'm not sure if all of it is is back out there so we need another great dr strange movie oh. perhaps convince them it's a good business there you go well we got a dr strange movie coming out next year along with venom too so we could yeah maybe we could get you could get two books in one year that'd be great but you said those stories are on comicology like all the run that i did like three years worth or not or the whole just... no not the whole run it oh. has it has a uh, slivers of it because i guess they collected them in other midnight suns trades um, okay. So there's a yeah. There's I saw a couple issues on there with your name on them, and that's why I only you know was when I was going through. I was like, oh yeah, the, the salami stuff, and yeah. And so um, so yeah, there's some of them, but not all of them. So you're right. We need a good solid collection of that stuff. And uh, yes, Carnage Classic. It is available. I think it's still in print now. Uh, but those that trade and these issues that we're talking about, like Mind Bomb and uh, and It's a Wonderful Life, all those are also on Comicsology as well. Okay. Fine. Awesome. And uh, and so before we go, you we... know where to find me on inwalkedquinn.com, yep. including, you know, taking a look at some of my um, children's books. Uh, if, you, if someone in your family is ready for a <laughs> bedtime story that happens to be about the baby monsters or something like that, I've been working on those too. And just like you said, it's it takes takes a lot of work to do it right, but I really enjoy it. Awesome. And guys, I'll put the link to his website down below and, uh, and you know, please go check out his stuff. And yes, if you go, if you're older, go out there, get his carnage stuff, get his Dr. Strange stuff, you know, tell Marvel to reprint a lot of it. And then if you have kids or, you know, someone with kids, you know, make sure they check out David's other work. Or if you just have an interest in those stories too, please check it out. Um, David, thank you so much for being here today. It really did mean the world to me, sir. Oh, my pleasure. Awesome. My pleasure. Keep up the great work. I will do my best, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for all the compliments. I don't take compliments very well, but I, I appreciate the work, kind words. Um, and everyone else out there, thank you so much for listening. Like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll see you all in the next episode. Peace. <laughs>